you have two choices. You can either seek to discover, go on a long hero's journey, as Jung would say, to discover your true self. Who am I? What am I? And that's a long journey for some, certainly was for me, it still is a journey. Or you can suppress it all and allow it to be all managed so that you appear to be normal. Because normal doesn't mean you're healthy, it just means you you fit into whatever the definition is, of normal is. And that's what the conventional medical system does. In today's busy world, how can we find the inspiration, knowledge, and energy to live a healthy and empowered life? If we balance and harmonize our mind, exercise our body, live according to the laws of nature, and connect to spirit, can we find a way to heal, become our authentic self, and live our purpose with love? I am your hostess, Amy Fournier, and welcome back to Awakening Aphrodite. Welcome back to the show, my friend. This show is about helping you to be healthy and fit in mind, body, and spirit, as well as harmonize your masculine and feminine energy, tap into your intuition, your true source of power, and awaken your authentic self. You are in for a special treat today because today we have in the house someone who is truly a wise elder. God knows our culture needs more of them, or at least we don't hear about them too much. Where are they? But I'm hoping they're all going to now be shared with the world because the world needs that wise, loving guidance from people who have experience and depth and knowledge and heart more than ever. I know you agree. So I'm thrilled to tell you that my guest today, Rudy Vespor, is actually going to be doing a series on my show he so graciously uh, agreed to come on the show a couple times because, well, he's a wise elder. He has a ton of very important, very practical, helpful, not well-known information that we're going to try to get out of him today so we can apply it to our lives and also share it with the world because the world needs this stuff. Who is Rudy Vespor? Well, Rudy's been studying and practicing homeopathy and the romantic science and healthcare for more than two decades. He has extensive clinical experience in the application of this rational system of identifying and removing, now listen to this, the underlying causes, okay? You, I know if you subscribe to the show, you're all about getting to the root problem, right? So yes, bang on on this regard. Rudy has written several books, and he's lectured in many countries, including Canada, the U.S., the U.K., and throughout Europe. From 1993 to early 2001, he served as the director of the British Institute of Homeopathy in Canada. Seeing the need for a more comprehensive education and training, he established the Hanneman College for Hellkunst. Hope I said that right. And he also founded the School of Romantic Science and Healthcare. So listen, my friends, this is only the first episode. You're going to want to subscribe to get the rest of what he's saying. And we're probably going to do at least two, one more, if not two more uh, episodes for you. So this one, we establish the foundation. We talk about, all right, what exactly is homeopathy? Why do we need to know? And what is the history of it? We talk about this principle called the generative power that I'm sure you never heard of because let me tell you something. I've been in this industry, well, the healthcare industry, holistic healthcare, for more than three decades and I never heard this expression. What is it? But what I also love is we're going to talk about energy, the energetic field, the energetic pattern of our, our diseases and our health. And this is why homeopathy is effective because it affects us on an energetic level and everything starts at that level first. So to get to that root cause and to change it or fix it or heal it, we got to go back to that energetic level. And this is a big missing piece in modern healthcare. But guess what? Rudy shares with us, it's also a common missing piece even to alternative healthcare and functional medicine and natural paths. They're missing this piece too. This is why homeopathy has become like my new gig, my, my new BFF. I'm like loving this whole field because I've never heard it in this regard. I mean, I'm not living under a rock. I've heard of homeopathy. You can't not hear of it being in my, in my uh, profession, 
but I never was really on board. I didn't really get it. But here's the thing, my friends, just like everything in life, it could be a yoga instructor or whatever. You can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. You just got to find the right fit. What I mean by that is you might take a yoga class and not like it, but that doesn't mean you don't like yoga. You just got to find the right one. And homeopathy ended up being that for me. I found Rudy. He's got it bang on, dead on the bullseye, baby. And I'm sharing him with you. So we talk about bioenergy versus biochemistry. And we talk about the layers of treatment, the four levels of causation, how important it is for healing in a sequential order. Very important. We talk about patterns and Jungian archetypes, and he shares with us the eight patterns. We talk about how strengthening the organism is key. We talk about healing trauma. And this is important whether you're aware of that trauma or not, meaning maybe you've, you know, de-associated de with it and you've blocked it out, but you can still heal it energetically because your body and your soul is sure aware of it. We also talk about how a problem is lodged in the energetic body and then it affects the physical body. And that's why we've got to remove it on an energetic level. And Rudy shares with us this concept of the true self versus the false self. Really cool tips on how we can liberate the true self and individualization and how that's important. That's some of Jungian's work. We talk about authority versus freedom, control versus freedom, and being self-empowered versus being a victim. So this is just, you know, just really put on your thinking cap for this one. You're probably not going to want to completely multitask when you're listening to it because just like my interview with Dr. Ibrahim Karim, founder of Biogeometry, that's episode 148, The Origins of Life Force and Feminine Energy, like you've never heard him before with Dr. Ibrahim Karim of Biogeometry, 148. You, If you love this kind of thing, you've got to check out that episode because I, like I said in the title, you're, you're going to be blown away. And it's very, very important. It's the foundation of everything, 148. And he's coming back on the show too. Because these are two huge, huge behemoth men that are pioneers and wisdom carriers. And I'm thrilled to share them with you. So Rudy will be coming back in that next episode. Stay tuned. I got a lot of questions for this guy. And I bet you do too. So if you do, let me know. Hit me up. Instagram, FitAmyTV, or email my name, amy at amyfornier.com. Let me know what you want me to ask Rudy, all right? I'd love to do that for you. Let's do this together. Thank you so much for listening. Don't forget to subscribe. If you want to support me, share the show, follow the show, leave a review. That would be amazing. It only takes a second. And check out all my favorite products on my e-store, which is just my name. And there's coupon codes there for you. Enjoy the show now with Rudy Vespor. Welcome back to Awakening Aphrodite with Amy Fournier. Rudy, welcome to the show. Well, thank you for having me. I was really quite uh, pleasantly surprised when you invited me, but I'm more than happy to talk to anyone about uh, what I know, what I do, and share it. Uh, and if people can benefit from that in, in any way, that's great. Well, you know, Rudy, honestly, it's people like you that are why I do the show because my, sh I really, my intent for the show is to help be a platform to spread information that I feel really will help people on a significant deep level and finding people like you that actually have information like that, that's knowledge and wisdom and stuff that really works is, is, is really my joy to be able to use this this medium to reach as many people as possible. So, um, like I mentioned in the introduction, I work with you personally. You've helped me personally. Every time I talk to you, I'm more and more amazed at the depth and the wisdom that you carry. And, um, I guess maybe unfortunately in my experience, it's kind of rare <laughs> to have some exposure to someone like that. So I feel like, uh, it is truly my honor to share you with others. So, Thank you again for agreeing to be here because I know you're super busy. Oh, you're quite welcome. Okay. So how would you summarize, Rudy, what you do and the effects of what you do, how it helps people? Well, I've been in this field, uh, natural health field, for over 30 years now. I'm, I got into it, the, the typical wounded healer um, mythology. 
um, I got very sick and I was forced to find an answer for myself. But I think the what I've come to discover more recently is, and the reason why I do these, uh, willing to do these talks is that the essence of my mission on earth, you could say, is to get the word out about what I'm about to say, because I've discovered, strangely enough, in 30 years, uh, no one else talks about it, no one else knows about it. And it's like the greatest open secret in the world, as far as I'm concerned. Well, what is that? Well, what it is, is an understanding that Strangely enough, there is no science in Western medicine. There is also no science in the alternative health field. That's not to say they can't help people, but my interest has always been as a scientist. Uh, you know, you, you can only advance knowledge and understanding through science. Otherwise, it's just everybody's opinion and, well, I do this and I do that. and. So I've always been interested in only doing things that I could justify scientifically. So I was very discouraged when I first uh, entered uh, university and I wanted to go into pre-med. And I discovered uh, very quickly that it was not scientific. <laughs> Western medicine was not, that was a big shock. And then I left and, you know, went off and did a more conventional career or whatever until I got really sick and then I was, thrown back into this whole question of, you know, uh, studying medicine. And I went into the naturopathic field. And I was totally discouraged because again, I didn't find any science in there. Uh, science of true science of life, you know, because of course, it has to be a science of life. And I discovered finally, I left naturopathic medicine went into homeopathic medicine. And to my dismay, I didn't find much science there, at least not the way that it was being practiced by, uh, you know, people and taught uh, what's today called classical homeopathy. I trained that way, but again, it was sort of like, well, this is not scientific. So with my Dutch background and a friend, Stephen Decker, who's a German scholar and understood this much better than I did, um, I was able to eventually read the original writings of Dr. Hahnemann, uh, the founder of homeopathy in German, and discovered that uh, we were, the whole message got lost in translation. I love that film, Lost in Translation, because it tells us a lot about the fact that we think we know, but until you've read something in its original writing and understood it, you really haven't understood it. So there were many writings by Dr. Hahnemann never translated and uh, never read, therefore, by people in the English speaking world. But even the ones translated weren't translated right, uh, because you, to be a good translator, a render, you have to really understand the terms and the concepts and, and they didn't. So what was being hidden? What was missing? Well, what was being hidden and what was missing was the revelation that Dr. Hahnemann had about something. And that something is the fact that everyone in the natural health field talks about the life force, the vital force, the living power, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. That's fine, it does exist. But what Dr. Hahnemann, along with his German contemporaries at the time, discovered is that there are two streams flowing in this life force or this living power. And one stream is kind of what just keeps the engine going. It's what uh, produces homeostasis. You know, everybody knows homeostasis, you know, homeostatic balance. But the other stream nobody talks about. Uh, and yet it's a very important one. It's the one that produces cell division. It's the one that allows you to create new human beings, and make babies. Um, but it's also the one that allows you to have a creative idea. The nature of genius operates off of this other side of the, the living power. So it operates at the level of mind as well as body. In any case, uh, what does that mean? It means that, as Dr. Hahnemann discovered, 
that when you get sick, you can get sick one of two ways. One way is a disorder, an imbalance, which simply means you didn't drink enough water, you didn't get enough nutrition, you didn't get enough sunshine, or you got too much sunshine, et cetera, et cetera. And that is what the natural health field is all about. That's what uh, naturopathic medicine was essentially all about, uh, which is to, well, let's balance all that. Let's get back to balance. Okay, well, let's order the disorder, fine. Um, except it's missing the other half. And um, I had a patient who came in once and this young lady, I don't know if you heard this story, I've told it many times, but it's so revealing. She didn't want initially to be treated, she just had a question and she wanted me to answer it for her. I don't know why it came to me, I guess sent by the universe. In any case, um, she five years earlier had been very sick. She'd gone to see a naturopath and uh, everything disappeared. She got well and she went on until six months before coming to see me, she uh, had a, an emotional trauma shock. All of her symptoms came back, but now they're worse. So she went back to the naturopath, uh, tried everything else, nothing worked. So he gave up and she came to see me and said, why, why, why is this case? You know, why did I, it all go away and then it all came back again. And now it's even worse than it was before and they can't fix it. Well, those are all good questions. And the answer I told her is essentially because the naturopath didn't treat the other side of the equation and naturopathic medicine can't do that because they don't recognize it or nothing actually in the natural health field recognizes that other side of the equation. And that is the generative power. Now, what happens when the generative power is damaged? Okay, we can talk if you want about how it gets damaged, but let's just assume it gets damaged. Well, it's not a matter of, um, how should we put it, just uh, doing more or less of something. Um, when the generative power is damaged, it's like a negative pregnancy. It's like Rosemary's baby, you know, you you have something that shouldn't be there and is degenerative. It's actually, you know, um, killing you um, in a sense. And you cannot remove it by changing your diet, by doing more exercise, by, uh, you know, being more loving. All those things aren't going to work because it requires a different law of nature. See, everything has to be done by law. So everything on the um, so-called natural health field, naturopathic side is all treated by the law of opposites. Too much water, drink less water. Too much sun, get less sun. You know, too much excitement, uh, to get some rest. But that doesn't work on the other side of the equation. You have a law, and this is what Dr. Hahnemann discovered or rediscovered because the Greek physicians knew about this. And you need the law of similars. So you've been poisoned by arsenic. What do you need? You need some arsenic. Now, this is a hard law to, dis to understand because people think, well, oh, hang on a minute. You know, I just poisoned by arsenic. You want to give me more arsenic? Well, the Greek physicians didn't touch this law because it's dangerous. But Dr. Hahnemann found a way to make it very safe. And the way he made it safe was that he rendered the poison, in this case, arsenic, immaterial. He got rid of all the material aspects of arsenic and you end up simply with the energetic pattern of arsenic. Wow. And so you can give an energetic pattern of arsenic to someone poisoned by arsenic and you can destroy the arsenic disease in that person. The body will get rid of the material arsenic, but you're left with the arsenic disease. This is the problem with drugs, for example, the so-called side effects. These are not side effects. These are disease effects. Correct. They just not ones they want and they ignore them or try to, you know, uh, override them with other drugs and it becomes a cascading uh, series of side effects. And these are just new diseases being added on. And so, you know, they manage the one problem, but they create other problems. This is called iatrogenic disease. So to get rid of 
anything require on the generative side, which is a true disease, not just a disorder or an imbalance, you need to use the law of similar. So that's what homeopathy and general parlance um, and what people understand of it is, is all about the law of similars. However, there are uh, the difference between the way I approach it, and this is based again on Dr. Hahnemann and others, and the way most homeopaths or all that I can, as far as I can see, uh, approach it is that they ignore a very basic law that Dr. Hahnemann set out. And what he set out was, well, you first treat the, uh, what he called the primary disease, then you treat the secondary disease. And the primary disease is the trauma, okay? You bang your head, you uh, had a whiplash, you got rear-ended, and that's what you need to treat. Well, the classical homeopathy treats the symptoms. Oh, what symptoms do you have? And they find remedies that match the symptoms, but those can vary from person to person, and that's time-consuming, etc. But the primary disease, as Dr. Hahnemann said, has only one remedy. For every trauma, there's only one remedy. So you don't have to spend a lot of time figuring out what the patient needs. You just need to know what the trauma was. Now, by doing that, you destroy this disease. However, there are times when there are residual diseases that remain behind for various reasons we could go into, but it's a bit complicated. Um, and you may need to then depend on symptomology. So that's when the more classical symptomological approach, what Hahnemann called the secondary diseases, uh, which is the homeopathic prescribing. So the difference here is, and, and my, my message really is, is that everyone seems to be treating for symptomology. It doesn't matter whether it's the conventional medical system or the natural health field, you have a pain, a disorder, a rash, a cough, or a headache. It, they're all trying to just get rid of that symptom. Why? Because that's all they can see, all they understand. And yet, to me, it's like shooting the messenger. Uh, because the symptom is a message. It's telling you there's a problem. You know, it's, it's, you could say God's gift to us that we have a problem. Otherwise, we wouldn't know we had a problem. We just think everything's fine. And I've had a few cases where people have never had a symptom in their life, you could say. And yet, uh, when they came to me, they came because they'd been told they're going to die in six months. So these are rather strange cases, but they're, you know, as Goethe would say, the um, German poet scientist, um, an instance is worth a thousand, meaning just one case like that illustrates the fact that you could have no symptoms and be very sick, but you don't know it and no one can see it because it's hidden. And so having a symptom is actually a blessing. It tells you, oh, you've got a problem. You've got to stop and try to identify what the problem is. The problem is, unfortunately, in the medical field, that the whole medical field, including conventional, non-conventional, is all about making that symptom go away. And once it's gone, you think the problem is solved. And that was the problem with this young lady, is all the symptoms went away and she thought her problems were solved. And then they all come back again. And they're worse now, why? Because no one addressed the causes of her symptoms. So my focus has always been, I don't mind temporarily alleviating the symptoms, but that's not the focus of the treatment. The focus of the treatment is to identify and get rid of the causation. When you do that, the symptoms leave on their own accord. You don't really have to make them leave. So, for example, uh, if you have yeast, uh, systemic yeast problem, I had this. You know, you go to a naturopath, as I did, and they give you all sorts of so-called natural ways of killing the yeast, and, and, you know, yeast die off, and, you know, everybody knows this, who's been through that, but comes back. Why? Because 
the yeast are not the problem. The yeast are actually uh, a normal component of your gut. The problem is they get so stressed by your stress and your illness that they change form and they slip through the gut wall into the body to uh, escape the toxic sewer that your gut has become. And so we then start blaming the yeast and we kill the yeast. And yet what we should be addressing is why did your, your gut become such a toxic sewer that the yeast, which is uh, the candida, which is part of your gut micro, you know, uh, flora, uh, why did it feel it had to escape? So if you would address these deeper issues, the body's immune system will take care of the yeast um, because it gets strengthened. So, you know, really what I focus on is trying to teach people that you need to address causation. And yet we don't live in a world that talks about causation. Now, why is that? Well, because the causation can go very deep. So this takes us into a world that goes beyond the physical body. So now we're into a science of nature, which has nothing to do with biochemistry, but has a lot to do with bioenergy. And so now we're at the level of the what uh, Rudolf Steiner uh, in anthroposophical medicine calls the etheric body or life body. And that's just a term that used to be recognized several hundred years ago. The scientists, physicists talked about the ether. The ether was this kind of living dynamic uh, cushion that enveloped the earth from which all life came. And so for Steiner to call it the etheric body, well, because it's linked to this etheric envelope, you know, this, um, and there's another scientist, Dr. Wilhelm Reich, who scientifically demonstrated the existence of that ether. Um, and so you have levels of disturbance at the etheric body level, not just the physical body level. And then we can go higher and we can, uh, you know, uh, thank the whole work of psychoanalysis, at least for grounding it in terms that we can understand, because the ancients talked about this uh, centuries ago, and Rudolf Steiner talks about it, what we call the astral body level, which is the level of emotions, the level of conflicts, um, and uh, this is linked to the to the stars, to the zodiac, you could say. And so, of course, for many people, this becomes very esoteric, meaning, oh, oh you're you know, you're really getting way off, lift off from the earth here. And yet, this is a level of disturbance and causation that needs to be addressed. And then finally, you have the level of mind, you could say. Um, which is uh, unique to us in terms of uh, delusions, illusions, uh, uh, kind of uh, beliefs, false beliefs uh, about ourselves and, uh, oh, uh, eating meat is bad um, as a, a rule, you know, so you get people promoting veg being vegan. Well, from a scientific perspective, one size never fits all. So if you're promoting as a political thing, or you're promoting it because you want to save the earth, or you know, you think you want to save the earth, that's one thing. But from a medical perspective to say, well, everyone should stop eating meat, or everyone should, uh, you know, stop eating butter or something. Um, this makes no sense, because the question is, well, is it good or bad for you? And that depends on a lot of factors. I had a patient once who was suffering from constant fatigue. I treated her for many things, but she would never allow me to address the one issue that kept her in fatigue, which was that she was a vegan and she insisted on it. And I said, well, you can, but you also have to stop coming in and complaining about your lack of energy because I've taken all the other reasons away. And the only one that's left now is the this. So I said, wow. look at it this way. 
take a small amount of meat for medicinal purposes. I'm not saying you need to break your vegan you know, approach and you're entitled to your belief and everything, but you also have to accept it has certain consequences, natural law. Anyway, she came in several months later and uh, she admitted she had had a small amount of meat and she got her energy back. But she said, I'm not going to stop being a vegan. I said, that's fine. But, you know, if you're asking me to help you with your energy problem, then I'm going to give you a scientific answer, which has nothing to do with politics, nothing to do with belief, nothing to do with religion. It just has to do with science. And ultimately, that's what all medicine, true medicine should be based on. So that's kind of the core of what I, you know, talk about and the core of what I practice in my clinic. Of course, it's lot in behind that and we could talk about a lot of things but you know if you're asking me for my kind of core message that's it just tremendous just tremendous how does paleo valley and wild pastures your companies how do they basically transform the meat industry how are they part of the solution yeah so our beef sticks are all sourced from american regenerative farms 70 to 80 percent of the grass-fed beef in america today is imported from other countries and so i think what we're doing when we support that is we're undermining our ability to create a sustainable food source and rehabilitate our soil here in america it's part of the solution because we work with these small-scale family farmers and we create that demand we connect them to the conscious consumers like your listeners at every Every stage of the process in all of our products, we're considering agriculture. We are understanding that link between human and environmental health. And so we're just creating products that help people support that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for making foods that taste good, are super healthy, are consciously produced, and so convenient. I mean, everybody right there. What else do you need to know other than, oh, you got a coupon code, Amy Fournier 10. That's all caps, A-M-Y-F-O-U-R-N-I-E-R 10. If you forget, it's on my website, recommended products. I really hope you try Pelia Valley. You won't regret it. Now let's get back to the show. Okay, let's start with some foundational terms for me and probably my audience to wrap our brains around because, uh, this is, this is frankly very new information for me. And I've been holistic health and wellness for over three decades. And I'm not very versed. I'm certainly not versed at all on homeopathy. Um, so let, why don't we start with that, Rudy? Because I would love your definition of what homeopathy is. Okay. Well, there's two definitions. One is the generic one that everyone understands when they say homeopathy, they mean uh, the system of medicine that Dr. Hahnemann, the German physician invented over 200 years ago. It's simply a term that Dr. Hahnemann coined because it means similar suffering in Latin. Okay. So, all it means is treating by the law of similars. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, inside his writings, he gave it a more specific meaning because pathic also means suffering and suffering means symptoms. Okay. So in his system, there are two applications roughly of the law of similars. One, according to the primary disease, which is all about cause. Okay. Mm -hmm has nothing to do with symptoms. He doesn't care about the symptoms. It's about what caused your, uh, your symptoms. And then he would seek the cause. Oh, uh, did you have an accident? Did you drink something? Did you, uh, someone die in the family? Uh, you know, you have an argument with your spouse, whatever. And so for that treatment, he had a different uh, terminology. He didn't use homeopathy. He effectively used a term that was actually German at the time, and that was Heilkunst. Now, Heil simply means whole, and Kunst simply means uh, science. So, the science of wholeness. And yet, what he meant by that, when you read about it, it meant simply to get rid of the underlying causation, because for him, that was the science. 
no treatment was truly scientific unless, and there could be no cure could be claimed unless you got rid of the causation. So yeah, here, take this, your headache will go away. If it's done based on the symptomology without treating the cause, that's not a cure. Your headache went away, fine, you, you get relief, but you can't claim a cure, it can always come back again. And so homeopathy is simply, at one level, the law of similars, the natural law of similars. You have arsenic poisoning, you need arsenic. You have uh, a, you know, a vaccination uh, illness disease, you need a remedy that has the same vibrational frequency as that vaccine to remove the, the disease caused by that vaccine. Or you took a drug or you took an antibiotic and you got you know, an illness, a disease resulting from that, uh, you need a similar remedy. Okay, that's what basically what homeopathy means. The problem is, as I mentioned, that the vast majority, if not all other people claiming to use homeopathy is they're using it in the narrower sense of treating according to symptomology. They're just chasing the symptoms. Yep. Which Dr. Hahnemann said is only to be done when you can't find a cause. And that makes sense. Sometimes you can't find a cause or at the time you can't find a cause. So you treat symptomologically, but you never stop looking for a cause. Now, again, to find the cause requires a fairly good understanding of causation. And the best person to ever talk about causation in a scientific way was Aristotle. Oh, wow. He said there were four levels of causation. There's the immediate or exciting cause. There's the formal cause, which is the next level. So immediate exciting would be, well, your, your brain is inflamed, that's why you have a pain. So let's give them an anti-inflammatory. That's treating that first level of causation. Mm -hmm. Formal cause would be more or less the idea of a trauma. And that would be, well, did you do anything? Yeah, I, uh, someone rear-ended me a week or two ago and, and I still have this headache. You know, They don't mention that at first necessarily, but that's the formal cause. Okay, let's remove that. Then the third level, he said, there's a remote cause. A remote cause takes us back up into the super sensible world. Okay, now the super sensible world has to do with, let's say the remote cause could be a particular weakness that you brought into this life as a child. Okay. And that is now operating underneath your headache. So I'll give you an example of that. Oh I had a lady, a young lady, a mid mid thirties or whatever, and she had a couple of active kids running around her when she called me. I don't know how she got my name, but in any case, she was on the couch, she couldn't move. Oh and um, her left leg or I believe it was her left leg had a completely elbow, uh, knee had completely swollen up. And she was convinced it was due to the uh, Rogam shot that they gave her after or before I can't remember her her last, uh, you know, baby her child was delivered. And I said, that's possible. Because she heard I got rid of those things, I guess. But she, I said, that's possible. I said, but there could be other hidden causes. So these are remote causes. So I treated her for that cause. The knee swelling disappeared. She was fine. We kept treating for the deeper ones because I explained we needed to, you know, treat for other things. We eventually got to a point where her knee swelled up again temporarily because we hit a deeper remote cause and then we did for that. And since then, she has not, and I talked to her maybe a year or two ago, so this is 20 years ago when I treated her. So anyway, since then, she's not had any recurrence of that, of that problem. So that's the third level, okay? These are things no one would look for because who would make that connection, right? I couldn't tell her which of those it was, but I knew there was a remote cause, likely, because the remote cause makes you susceptible to more susceptible to the formal cause. 
And then finally, and this is the most esoteric of all that Aristotle says, is the ultimate cause. Well, what is the ultimate cause? The ultimate cause, you could say, is because we live in ignorance. We don't have complete knowledge. So we do things sometimes in a wrong way. We create problems for ourselves. Um, we're out of tune with the universe. We're out of tune with God. Um, we don't follow our true internal desire function. We get caught up in the rat race. Uh, we get caught up in doing things because that's what other people want or the system wants or our you know, geography wants or our ethnicity wants or whatever. Um, so that's the, you could say the ultimate cause. So eventually you have to work your way up to that because that's always going to create problems for you until you can address that. So it's a bit of a journey to find all of the levels of causation, but that requires an understanding of causation. If you have no understanding of those other three levels and only the immediate one, oh, your brain is inflamed or your blood is this or that. And so that's what's causing the problem. We'll correct that. But you then ignore those other three levels. There's no cure going on. Okay. So anyway, that that's the uh, the issue of treating for causation. And for Dr. Hahnemann, this was very important. Treating according to symptoms is only when you can't uh, find the causation. So you temporarily give relief, basically. Mm -hmm. So one thing I've learned is the uh, the importance of the sequential order of treatment. And in um, Chinese medicine, I've heard it called the principle of step-by-step -step in healing. Uh -huh. um, and I, I think that's what I'm hearing you say, that it, it's almost like layers. When you're treating someone, it's peeling layers and getting deeper, deeper, with starting at the top. And in treatment with you, when we started together, um, you had me do a timeline of anything that I could pretty much remember causing an issue for me. Uh, emotionally, physically, spiritually, et cetera. Um, and we started treating it from the most recent backward. Um, yes, yes. So the layers. So would you like to speak to that as why this is very, very important and the effectiveness of the treatment is the order in which you address things? Well, everything happens in time. Yeah. Therefore, you can't ignore time. Um, someone wants to asked a physicist why there was time and he joked so that uh, everything wouldn't just happen at once i've heard that too uh, yeah, yeah. It's, tr it's true even it's though true. i guess it is supposedly <laughs> but the reality is the law of healing in terms of the body's innate healing power is to tackle the most immediate problem and then work your way backwards. But if you keep piling on problems, the body never gets to anything. It's always trying to address the most recent one. So we follow that rule. We just say, oh, it's trying to work on the most immediate problem. We'll remove that. Then you very quickly discover it moves on to the next one. So you have to follow it. So we're just following the life force. We're not forcing it to go anywhere. We're just following where it wants to go. And I've demonstrated that uh, clinically so many times, but it's, it's definitely um, a law, a natural law. Then the question, of course, comes when you get to the end of your timeline, what do you do about the things that you inherited? Okay, and we're not talking about the genetics, we're talking about the epigenetics, the kind of environmental context within which you learn the genealogical weaknesses of your family line, etc. Uh, well, Dr. Hahnemann made a beginning of trying to uh, address this problem, which was quite remarkable. And over the last 200 years, others have contributed to it, and I finished it off in a way, so that we now have a map of the inherited disease patterns. These are archetypal patterns, what Jung called archetypes. Uh, and they are the same for everyone, not the content. If we, we could think of the blockchain, if anyone knows about the blockchain, you've got a block and then there's a certain amount of information in that block. Um, 
So each one of these inherited disease patterns is like a block and there's a certain amount of information, but the information for each person is different for that particular kind of block. And there are eight patterns, eight archetypal patterns. And again, you have to work through them sequentially and that's been worked out. And you have to work through them at, in terms of layers. So uh, not only we have, we have, you could say sequence in two ways. We have it across time and in space. And the point is that when you get to a certain point, you sometimes have to work through layers then you can move on to another point. It gets a little bit complicated, but nonetheless, there's a kind of a, a two-fold type of sequ sequentiality. And then finally, the one that I mentioned uh, uh, earlier, well, not finally, but the third level of causation is uh, the psychological subconscious conflicts that we have. And there is, again, a sequence there that has to be followed, but that sequence I haven't discovered, I have to wait for the body to produce it. Uh, Excuse me, is that the remote though? The third you said? The, is that well, the no, the, the third is the astral body level. So the, oh. the, the yes, uh, it's, it's remote as well. But we're talking before about the physical body, yeah. the etheric body, the astral body, and then the mind or the eye. Yeah. So, the, these inherited disease patterns operate at the level of the etheric body of the of the ether, the cosmic ether, and the th next level of causation is this um, astral body level of emotion and emotional conflict, etc., subconscious stuff, and that there's no discernible, at least I haven't found it, a uh, sequence that I could just tap and say, oh yeah, that's the one that we follow. I have to wait for the body to present itself uh, and say, I have a problem that I want to address. And then I have to use uh, a special kind of bioresonance technology to identify the contents of that problem. So that gets a little more esoteric as it were, but nonetheless, the issue is still there that there is a a sequence that needs to be followed. You're absolutely right. And if you do it out of sequence, uh, you can cause a lot of disturbances. I've seen that, uh, where you go right to the problem that's apparent, and you try to treat for that without treating for the other things, you know, between now and then. And uh, the reason we do it sequentially is we strengthen the organism and the person in order to deal with those deeper ones, because certainly in your timeline, the earlier traumas are much more profound and go deeper into the disturbance of your life force than the later traumas. And that's why young, you know, early childhood vaccination is such a problem. So compared to adult vaccination. So. Because because it goes deeper. The, the, the child's immune system up to the age of two, two and a half is almost non-existent. And um, they have no, uh, you could say, preparation. They're, they're completely open systems or innocent, as we would say. Mm -hmm. But that's just another way of saying completely open energetic system. They're open for a reason. Vulnerable, open. very vulnerable. Yeah. yeah, they're vulnerable, but they're open for a reason. So they absorb everything. That's why they learn language. Uh, you know, they, it's the most amazing thing. They, they just take in everything. And they're then of course, that becomes more and more separated. But the thing is, then they're the most vulnerable. And they didn't used to vaccinate uh, children until they were two, two and a half for that specific reason. And of course, that's either forgotten or ignored. But uh, unfortunately, yeah we would have far fewer problems. We still have problems, but we'd have far fewer problems if they waited until two, two and a half uh, to start injecting these children. And unfortunately in the US, we're now up to uh, like 78 vaccinations. It's, it's just like gone completely uh, out of control. Well, what you're making me think of is uh, this, this idea of the importance of strengthening the, the overall base of the organism before getting to deeper more difficult things. You said that's just kind of a universal principle as well. And that um, one thing I know in my work in holistic health is it takes energy to heal. It takes energy 
to, to, to make energy, you know, and a lot of people are just too tired and their body, you know, detoxification, all that stuff. And, you know, dealing with pathogens or viruses or whatever is something that, you know, there's a reason why we get tired because your body might be dealing with something inside that you can't see and you're wondering why. So, and that's also the basis for disassociation and trauma. You know, the, when a child can't handle something, it's above what they're capable of dealing with. We disassociate. So it's, it's, it, it, it breaks the threshold of their capacity to manage it. So something that's very important. Yeah, and, and uh, that's every trauma that is unresolved is like a radioactive container uh, that requires a lot of energy to keep it from damaging you. And so if you can remove that, it releases that energy to, yes, go into the healing, etc. A lot of people have memories that come back from childhood that were they didn't know or obviously suppressed. Why? Exactly for that reason, to protect the person as a survival mechanism. But once you have enough energy and you're healthy enough, your life force will bring it up to be dealt with, but only now because it knows that you can handle the, the trauma. You try to bring it up earlier and, and it, it's forcing something that could be quite damaging if you do it that. There's a reason why you've forgotten. So on that note, okay, so conventional talk therapy. I mean, I know for me that some of the traumatic things that happened to me that you're, you're aware of that's in my chart. Um, the talk therapy, my whole done nothing. I mean, doesn't even touch it. And then what, what does intrigue me is, you know, the somatic therapy that, you know, your, my cells, my body remembers what happened. That's for sure. But my mind gets very fuzzy in certain areas. And, uh, what I'm anticipating is one, you know, as I heal and get better, um, those memories might start to be jostled a little bit. But can you explain to us, Rudy, how, what is the mechanism that, that's actually happening? Because going back to this idea of the energetic pattern and you're treating bioenergy rather than biochemistry, but you're really kind of treating biochemistry too. Right? What's happening there when, when my, let's just use me, for example, my body starts to heal, my, my level of strength is getting higher, my life force. So you're starting to peel away those layers, but and then we're starting to get to that real root trauma. Um, how are we doing that with the, the remedies? Like what's, what's happening there? Well, this is where you have to understand uh, the organism uh, dynamically or energetically. If you simply understand it biochemically, then it doesn't make any sense. But in our understanding and system, all trauma is registered in the energetic body or the ether body, life body. Okay. Now, if you were to have a trauma, let's say, and this happened, um, the mother called me up in a panic because the uh, child had uh, opened a window sash and, and the window came crashing down on her fingers. And uh, so I said, well, give her these remedies. She had a remedy kit and uh, a first aid kit. So I give her these remedies and, and literally the pain disappeared. Um, there was no bruising, no swelling. It's as if it never happened. Now, how is that possible? <laughs> well, because we removed the imprint or the registration of that trauma in the energetic body by using homeopathic or energetic remedies. It's like it never happened. It's like it just as if it were written in invisible ink or disappearing ink. Now, if it isn't registered in the energetic body, if the energetic body is strong enough in the organism to resist the trauma, it's not a trauma. Now, it may look like a trauma to someone else, but it's not a trauma to this person because they were able to handle it, absorb it, digest it, 
and it never registered. It never made it to the register in the energetic body. But once it's registered there, even if the physical evidence disappears, okay, everything appears to be healing, uh, the bruised uh, part of the body and the swelling is gone without treatment, but you know, oh yeah, I'm fine now. A couple of weeks ago looked pretty bad, but now it's all fine. But if it's severe enough, there will be a mark a registry in the energetic body. And that causes a kind of static in the information system, the exchange of information going on in the physical body. Okay. And that's what's driving the biochemistry. How does the body know how many of these things to make and how much of that to make? It's a very complex uh, system. And so all this information signaling is going on. And then there's a static. It's like if you got a call from someone and said, uh, I want to meet you at eight o'clock, you know, and well, where, you know, where at eight o'clock and, and, you know, you can't connect with this person or you order something on the phone. The other person thinks you want three dozen and all you wanted was three. And somehow they, because of static, they heard three dozen. So three dozen things arrive on your doorstep and you only wanted three. So you can see what can happen inside the body, all sorts of mistakes, as it were. So this problem is not lodged in the physical body. This, this memory of a problem, not in the physical body, it's in the energetic body. That's why physical treatment cannot remove it. There's no drug that can remove it. There's no therapy, whether it's talk therapy or any other kind of therapy that can remove it. Um, now, if it's a minor disturbance, okay, you're upset about something, you know, a friend can talk to you and you can feel better afterwards, or you can go see a therapist and, you know, help you understand something. But because there was no disease, there was no registry of a trauma. There was just, a, I'm upset, <laughs> you know, and yeah, therapy can work quite well in those, in that regard. Uh, I used to do that with my kids, you know, they're just upset. There's no trauma per se. So, but once there's a trauma, there's a register and it's in the life body. And the only way you're going to remove it is by the law of similars using a homeopathic in the right way uh, medicine, so, then it's gone. So in that regard, a homeopathic, like you had given the example of a, of, uh, a very, very, very low dose arsenic to, to treat arsenic poisoning, but it's something like a trauma, an emotional, psychological trauma. How, how, how does the remedy treat that? Because what's, what is the equivalent for the, what's the similar thing for a psychological trauma? There, there are, based on the bioenergy of the organism, there are only four categories of trauma, emotional trauma. Oh. One is loss. The other is anger. Uh, the third is envy, jealousy. It's like a, a, a bipolar aspect. And the fear. final one is fear. Yes. Yeah, fear. I would think fear is in there for sure. Okay. So, Four categories of energetic trauma. Okay. This is the, um, this is the, uh, wow. the way that the bioenergy in your system functions. Okay. It functions according to these four emotions. So the the first, let's say you're healthy and you suffer loss. Now, loss is not just losing someone near and dear to you. Loss can be a loss of being able to express your true self, a loss of being unable to develop an aspect of yourself because of societal beliefs or you know like when women were held back because oh, well, women can't do this uh, you know you have to be a man um so that's the first trauma that most people experience in a generic sense 
is just just loss. It's 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 they're not able to fully express who they are. So what happens is their energy gets pushed back their true energy your energy wants to flow according to who you are your true self and so it gets pushed back it can't flow according to the way it wants to flow and becomes frustrated okay now frustration is just the early stage of anger because what happens in a healthy person is a healthy person finally says as the italians would say basta you know forget about it i'm doing it anyway and you try to break out of this encircling control system that you know is around everyone whether it's societal or familial or racial or ethnic or you know it doesn't matter uh, there's always something trying to prevent you becoming the individual you are and so eventually you smash your way through like the incredible hulk you know, you just get really angry, rage, we call it, but it's still anger. It's the final stage of anger. Mm -hmm. And if you can't, though, or that gets suppressed, especially when you're young or you're dominated by some, you know, people very powerful, um, it goes into envy, jealousy. Okay, it, it goes back retreats further into the system and these are people who become very envious and jealous so you know let's say i know you and uh, you become really uh, wealthy successful etc etc if i'm healthy i would celebrate that wonderful that's great but if i'm not healthy and i'm restricted myself from being who i really am i become envious and then jealous are just flip sides of uh, one is passive, the other is active. And these people can stab you in the back, they can, uh, you know, become two faced, uh, you know, we all know that psychologically. And finally, if that isn't enough of a defense mechanism, then it all escapes into fear. These people just become very fearful. Okay. So this is what you have with autism. Autism is the stage where they're at the stage of fear. They're living in fear. Oh. And they, their whole system has, with respect to the outside world, is shut down. And uh, they don't feel safe. And so they want to live in their own world. And so anyway, but these are the four emotions. So all trauma is related to those four emotions. A trauma of fear, a trauma of uh, kind of betrayal uh, and the trauma of betrayal and is is felt at that level is felt as guilt because deep down they know it's not true but they so they feel guilty for you know having done this or having done that or not having done that or not being good enough or whatever but anyway it's a feeling of guilt and um, psychologically and then anger is just anger, of course, and, and uh, sadness, uh, loss is just that. If it becomes extreme, we call it depression. But depression is just a word that means you're going inward. <laughs> and that's exactly what loss does. It forces you inward to try to fix the problem. But, you know, many people can't find their way back out. So I used to be stuck in depression. So, that's so how'd you get out of it? through this system yeah that's partly why i you know i i couldn't find my way out so but with this i was able to heal all the things that were preventing me from you could say you know coming out did they start uh as you got more energy and got stronger did you start to get revelations insights i mean what what actually started happening that now allowed you to start climbing your way out of depression yeah, every, every trauma isolates you from your true self. So every removal of a trauma reconnects you to a degree with your true self, which allows you to see yourself truly. So I had a lot of realizations about myself, which were not very pleasant because the, 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 the self I had become, not my true self, but this false self, I had become was not a very nice person. 
um, I thought I was a very nice person. But of course, you get a realization I wasn't such a nice person. But that, I also realized that wasn't me. That was the traumatized me, um, the, the, the me that was withdrawn, that was, you know, had no energy, etc. because I also had chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, so once those things start to be removed and the energy starts flowing, you have a much different perspective of yourself. You have lots of realizations. Some patients have them all the time. I had one recently who just after a month or two of treatment, she said, oh, I just realized I'm such a control freak. You know, no wonder my boyfriend doesn't like me. <laughs> so, but that's a good realization because otherwise she thought she, she had no idea that she was being controlling. But then she realized, oh, I am in control. But again, that's not to condemn yourself for that because that's not your true self. That's the self that you became in order to kind of protect yourself because of all the traumas you had. So yes, it's a very interesting journey of self-discovery, that's for sure. So do you feel like all humans in that regard have the same baseline of self in that um, I don't want to say we're all kind of equal, but do we all, does that question make any sense? You know, like, uh, we all know. have, the, we all have two things. Yeah. We all have the germ of a true self in yeah. us. Yeah. Okay. We all enter this world though, with different baggage and we have different experiences. The question of whether we can uh, get rid of the false self, which is what's really just a, a, a temporary self that is operating until we can activate our true self, um, whether we can get rid of that by removing all of the traumas and then activating our true self. Well, that's a function of each person individually, not everybody discovers their true self, because in essence, you have in this world, you have two choices. You can either seek to discover, go on a long hero's journey, as Jung would say, to discover your true self, who am I? What am I? And that's a long journey for some certainly was for me it still is a journey. Um, or you can suppress it all and allow it to be all managed so that you appear to be normal because normal doesn't mean you're healthy it just means you're you fit into whatever the definition is, of normal is and that's what the conventional medical system does well we'll provide medication so that you can be normal you can function normally like giving a child who has uh, adhd or you know whatever heavy drugs so they can focus in class. And yet all the studies show that just because the child focuses doesn't mean they learn anything or they're any happier or whatever. But the point is that's an option. And some people choose that because they don't have the courage, uh, soul courage to undertake this long journey. So it becomes a choice. Um, you know, I didn't have a choice. You know, I'm not sure I would have made that choice except for the fact that I didn't really have a choice because I couldn't take allopathic medication. Uh, any drugs made me psychotic. So I had no choice. Uh, so I was desperately looking for another solution. That's what kind of, you know, led me into all of this. So. Uh, is it possible for any human being to uh, not be programmed into their false self? I mean, how can anyone get through any culture while no, being not, true to their... Or am I confusing? Okay. Not, no, it's not possible. Oh, it's not possible. Not possible. Yeah, I, I would think so. I mean, we're, pro we're all programmed by our culture, our family, our... Whatever yeah, we're religion. all programmed. And yep. degree of control and suppression of oneself is the greatest in westernized cultures for two reasons one is because we're more individual you know you go to a, a native tribe living in the amazon they're not individualized they they still live in this group 
soul mentality. Uh, I've, I've lived with people in Papua New Guinea, a very, you could say, Stone Age level of uh, development. There's no individuality going on there, or very little. Um, and so then, in that sense, not a lot of suppression or quite happy you know, to follow like preschool children or whatever, you know, whatever the teacher is saying or doing, and they don't feel suppressed because, but we are individualizing to a degree that never seen before in human history and evolution. And yet we're facing a control system, you know, societal, family, you know, ethnic, uh, racial, whatever, trying to, direct us where we go, you know, our parents telling us, no, you have to study to be a doctor, you know. Well, luckily, my parents never told me what I had to be. Um, but, you know, many people grew up in a family where it's very clear what you're going to be. Um, and or your society, oh, what's valuable is being a lawyer, not a plumber. Uh, so you follow that or you want to be a musician. Oh, how are you ever going to make any money doing that? You know, so you get all of this pressure and control so that's the greatest so in that sense freud wrote a book called uh, civilization as discontents and he was basically explaining that the more we control people who are in an individualizing society and on an individualized individualizing path the more illness we're going to have and that's what we're seeing today but don't we need to individuate in order to be our true selves? We do, but that, yeah. in, that individuation process is happening at a level of culture, okay, Western culture, okay. we're all part of, it's happening. The question is there are countervailing forces that are trying to stop it from happening. These are what we call, so we have this battle between authority and the individual. Mm -hmm or yeah. government and the individual, uh, because authority tends to be lodged in the government, but it, before it was the church and the individual, you yeah. know? So this is a, an ages long battle going on. It will continue, but the point is, that's why we have more illness and more disease in our time, is because we keep individuating and yet the counter forces keep trying to control that individuating process so because the, the, that they're trying to control basically yeah, us people, <laughs> yeah the otherwise people, they think it's mayhem the, the the forces that we call the deep state the cabal mm -hmm. them they they've been there forever since you know since the beginning of the whole process and they're playing the game um but their game is control and our game is, I want to be, right. uh, I could say, free. Now, that's no different than you are born into a family, you need a control system. Your parents are the control system. Now, it can be a benevolent control, but they have to tell you, don't run across the street, don't put your hand on the hot stove. You know, you need that. So that's fine. But at some point, when you become a teenager, there's a battle that goes on between the control and your desire to be free of that control. Now, healthy parents recognize that and help the child and support their freedom so that they become healthy enough to be on their own. Yeah. The unhealthy parent will try to retain a control, will try to con continually interfere with how you live your life. Um, but that's what we see too, uh, you know, any control system has this duality helping you on the one side, but on the other side, they try to uh, tell you what to do. And of course, sometimes it can lean too much one way and not, you know, another the other way. We're now going through a phase where it's more leaning in the direction of we're going to tell you what to think. So what do we have? Misinformation, disinformation. Uh, you know, we're going to tell you what you can publish and what you can't publish. And anyway, it's the point is that, yes, we have more illness and more disease right now, simply because we're going through a phase of, of intense battle between this uh, freedom <laughs> or desire for individuation and, and control. So. so 
what would your tips be for us, Rudy, and um, helping ourselves be more of our true selves and be liberated, but still contributing to society and being compassionate and supportive of others? I think the answer really ultimately is you have to be as healthy and get as healthy as you possibly can be because otherwise any effort to uh, break free from the control system, I'm not saying it's necessarily bad, sometimes a control system is necessary, but you need to be healthy enough and mature enough to be able to truly break away, otherwise you never do break away. You keep trying, but it just becomes frustrating. So instead of having an objective, I want to break away, the objective is I want to be healthy as possible. Once you're healthy, you will have the maturation, the understanding and the energy to be able to follow your own path and not feel like a victim, but rather go out and I'm just going to be myself. Otherwise, you're constantly feeling like a victim because the system will constantly put you down, but you just find creative ways around it. So let's say parents who are frustrated with the school system. Well, you can spend your whole time battling the school system, et cetera, et cetera. But maybe if you're healthy enough, you say, well, you know what? We'll just homeschool hmm. or we'll find a different kind of school or we'll move to another country. I have some patients now are moving to another country because they found a school that their kids love and it's what they desire. And so that's a creative solution. But the point is you're not fighting and being, you know, oh, it's so unfair. And yes, it is unfair. But the point is, what's your creative solution for you? And that only comes if you're healthy enough, because then you know who you are, you know what you want, you know what's right for you and your children and uh, whatever, your loved ones. Um, but otherwise, you're just constantly battling and trying to be you and trying to be whole, but not succeeding because you have all of this baggage, all of these blockages that are preventing you and you don't understand. It's like being in a dream where you know you need to run, but your feet feel like lead. And, you know, you're you're running through, uh, you know, some very thick liquid. And I used to have dreams like that as a kid. And wow. I, I can't escape. And yet I'm being chased by something, you know, nefarious. So the key is, if you make yourself healthy, then you have the energy, you have the ability, you have the creativity to find your own way in life and be happy because who isn't going to be happy if they are who they are, right? You, you, I saw your little dog running in the background there and that dog is going to be the happiest being a dog. If you try to treat it as a cat and turn it into a cat, it's not going to be a healthy, a happy dog. So, you know, we have to be, I need to be me, that song, I guess. Yeah. yeah. And if you're not you, well, you're never going to be happy. So you first need to find out who you are. You need to get the energy to do that. And, and again, that all summed in becoming healthy. So. Perfectly said. People have heard me say a lot on my show, because it's holistic, that light, like sound and color and different foods and water, this is all information for our body. It's instructions for our body. And we have to think of being healthy holistically, not just because of our diet or to work out. So can you just give us a basically 101 of light and biology and how it's connected, why it's important? Yeah, what we call light is a, is a small portion of the electromagnetic spectrum or electromagnetism. Mm -hmm. And it's a fundamental aspect of our reality. We may correct our diet and eat healthy and eat uh, fresh cooked foods and so forth. If we're not thinking about our light diet and how, well, how much light we're eating and the nature of the light we're eating, is it good light or is it junk light? It can be very uh, powerfully healing or very adversely affecting our health. And it really is all parts of our life. It's not just on the cellular level and how our cells work and our organs work, but it's also our lifestyle and our circadian rhythm, our, our relationship with day and night. And that has influence on our sleep, which is the most important healing aspect of our lives really is, is our sleep and the quality of our sleep. Well, it's really like the lazy person's health hack. 
because all you have to do is just sit there in front of it. You don't have to like, you know, feel motivated to go to the gym or, you know, I don't feel like taking a run or whatever it is. It's like, come on, you just sit there, you know, mm -hmm. every time that I feel like I'm too tired to do it, you know, or I'll do it tomorrow, whatever. And I just like, all right, I'll just do a couple of minutes. As soon as I get in there in front of the light, I'm just like, oh. I'm always amazed at how much better I feel. It is just like a mood changer almost instantly. This is truly one of my all time favorite things that I've ever bought in my entire life. And I'm not saying this lightly. You can use my coupon code at checkout to save some money, which always helps fit Amy TV five. All this is on my website under my recommended products e-store. Now let's get back to the show. I think this is a great place to, to wrap this one. And um, I have so many other questions. I know we're going to get into some other areas, um, particularly getting into the masculine and feminine energetics. Um, I definitely want to talk with you about divine timing in life and karma and all of these very deep uh, subjects that I know you're going to um, uh, have a lot of wisdom to share with us. And uh, I just want to direct the audience to subscribe or definitely check back in so you can hear some of the future episodes with Rudy that where we're going to go into those topics. Um, Rudy, is there anything today that you feel needs to be said to kind of bring some conclusion and wholeness to what we've discussed for, for people? For those who are ready and willing, um, the answer is you don't need to be a victim. You don't need to feel like a victim. There is a solution. The solution is not a quick fix, it's a journey. It's the classic hero's journey or heroine's journey. And um, you need to start, instead of uh, being frustrated by the problem, or situation you're in, you need to start looking for a way to take the first step on that journey to finding yourself. And in essence, uh, as far as I'm concerned, and I'm biased in this regard, obviously, is the only effective way of doing that is this approach that I offer. Um, I had to use it myself. I could I couldn't find it anywhere else. Now, that's not to say what other people offer along the way can't be helpful. There can be a lot of help uh, that could be obtained by all of these different therapies, even psychotherapy, you know, uh, mineral energies, but they don't have the map of how to get you to hell and back in a sense. Now, I, 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 I use that word hell simply because you're going to go into some dark places but the good news is you will have the power. It's like uh, those video games my kids used to play. You know, you pick up all sorts of power and strength along the way in terms of what you do so that when you do meet the, the dragon later on in another level, uh, you have the strength in your sword to defeat the dragon. And it's not, it's not scary because now you're, you're knowledgeable, you're prepared, etc. So. I'm there along the journey, or there are other practitioners. I'm not the only one. I have a school where I train people to do this. Um, they will be with you on that journey all the way. Uh, you have to undergo the journey, but they will be there to help you. I certainly, that's my promise to my patients. I'll be there as long as you continue the journey. So, so. And we couldn't ask for anything more. You know, I mean, uh, the Lord helps those who help themselves, you know, as long as we're walking together and, uh, you're, you know, you are not expecting me to row the boat alone, you know, otherwise it's going to go in a circle if only one of us is rowing our side. <laughs> exactly. That's beautiful. And where can people find you, Rudy? And again, I know you're coming back for a couple more episodes, but in the meantime, if they wanted to reach out to you what is available for them to have that support and where can they find it? Well, the, we have the basic uh, website, homeopathy.com. That's the easiest one for people to remember. But I set one up to explain in more detail the treatment process. And it's called uh, myhealthplan.center. 
Yeah. And that lays it all out and you can use the contact sheet and contact the clinic office. Francis in the clinic office is very good at uh, helping people and discussing the process. And again, it's up to you. I really don't need the business. I'm not, in the, I'm not here to, uh, but my view has always been that if you want to be treated, there's always room in my schedule. And I've discovered that's the case. That's the way God works. You know, I, I don't control the schedule, but there always seems to be space for those people who, who want to go on that journey, which is great. So Isn't that beautiful? I love it. It's, wow, it's so amazing. Rudy, thank you so much for taking the time today and um, just going into these very important deep things. I think we laid a really good foundation for folks for when we come back and, like I said, address some other things like karma, divine timing, some of the deeper layers. And um, yeah, those are a little more esoteric, so I didn't quite yeah, want to. Yeah, the- we didn't want to. We didn't want to start with that. We're we're being respectful of this of the proper sequence. We're 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 practicing what we preach. We started with that basic first. So um, I'm really I'm already excited for you to come back because, as you can see, I have a million questions, but. Uh, I'm sure our questions are good. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for being with us. You're still here. And uh, please share this with someone you think it might help. And uh, be sure to subscribe so you can catch Rudy when he comes back and we can take it to the next layer of healing and empowerment and true liberation of our true selves. Aho. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks, Rudy. Okay, everyone. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. Would you like to support my mission to help empower people all over the world to be all of who they truly are? If so, please subscribe to the show, leave a review on iTunes, and share it with a friend. And if you're looking to take immediate action to align your energy and optimize your health, visit amyfournier.com. Thanks for listening to Awakening Aphrodite. Let's awaken her together in you. I'm your hostess, Amy Fournier. And I already can't wait to be with you again and for you to hear what I have planned for the next show. Thanks for listening to Awakening Aphrodite with Amy Fournier. To learn more about Amy, check out her website, amyfournier.com. That's A-M-Y-F-O-U-R-N-I-E-R.com. You can also check out Amy's live and on-demand virtual fitness and yoga classes and sign up for her newsletter to receive a free mini ebook of three of her top tips for making holistic health a lifestyle. Again, that's amyfournier.com and get your ebook sent to your email immediately. Connect with Amy on the daily on Instagram at fitamytv, F-I-T-A-M-Y-T-V, and watch many of the podcast episodes and subtopic clips on her YouTube channel, which is also fitamytv. Enjoy, and we'll see you next time on Awakening Aphrodite.